John chapter 20. <clears throat> uh, we're going to be looking at, we have been looking at Christ's resurrection. And um, <clears throat> maybe, maybe, maybe I'll do the study and we'll do it together on Wednesday night or you can do your own study. Uh, just how often the resurrection of Christ uh, is mentioned in the New Testament. Um, I, we, we, when you go to Bible college, you hear these things from so-called theologians. And um, <clears throat> I, I went to two conservative Bible colleges. So they, they were telling us things like this, but they were saying this is what li liberal theologians come up with. Guys like Karl Barth and some others, a lot of German, a lot of German Lutheran theologians just came up with some wacky, wacky stuff. And one of them in particular, I'll never forget it. The, uh, I can't, I, I want to say it was Karl Barth, but it may not have been. And uh, if you don't know who Karl Barth is, don't worry yourself. Don't spend any, yeah, he's just a, just one of these liberal theologians. These guys like to look at, um, they like to look at uh, the book of Isaiah and give you all the reasons why they think there's no way in the world that Isaiah actually wrote that. Even though it says Isaiah. They'll look at the gospel of Matthew. And, and they'll give you all kinds of reasons why they don't believe that it was Matthew that actually wrote that. And uh, actually, for the first three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they have a doctrine that um, it's called the Q document. And they believe that because when you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and you see a similar story, you see a similar outline, you see similar statements made and so on. In fact, they, they follow this sort of the same theme. Then these liberals come up with this idea that obviously they copied from uh, all the same document. In other words, Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, didn't write their own version of Christ's life and his death, burial, and resurrection. They were copying from a document called Q. And, um, and that's why they, they're all so familiar to each other. Uh, I don't believe that. Nobody with, a, nobody with a Christian brain, nobody with the Spirit of God in them would believe that. Um, the Bible very, very distinctly says, holy men of God spake as they copied from Q, right? No. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so that's what we believe. And it, it, is, it, it is absolutely no secret at all to me. It's no mystery to me how that Matthew, Mark, and Luke could have written their Gospels independent of each other and yet got the story so close to each other. That's because it's the same Spirit that is giving them the words to write down. John, as I've taught before, John, his Gospel is altogether different than what Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote. And that's a, that is a very prominent pattern in the scriptures. Whenever you find four of something, one of them's going to be different than the other three. And I could just go all night and just show you that. But anyway, so that follows a pattern of God as well. But anyway, um, <clears throat> we believe that uh, Matthew wrote what Matthew wrote, John wrote, uh, John wrote, was those words were given to him by the Holy Spirit. And, let's, and let me say this, not the thoughts, but the exact words were given. Um, I, told, I mentioned that video that I watched Sunday. And uh, I, was, I was dead on on what they would be saying about, uh, they had this young college lady that was asking this uh, professor guy why is it that there are mistakes and errors in the New Testament 
And um, that's where I had to cut it off and we came out here and had church service and I told you about it. And I, and I told you then, I said, I, I'm pretty sure I know where they're going after this. They're going to say that uh, in the case of the three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all came from the same source. And so if, if w that source has an error in it, then obviously whoever copies from that source is going to copy the same error. And that's what they said. Um, they also said and made this statement, and I knew they would. They said that when God transmitted the Bible, and you ask yourself whether you believe this or not, when God transmitted the Bible to those Bible writers, God was more interested in transmitting the truth of the importance of the life of Christ, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, the atoning of Christ, the gospel of Christ, and so on, that God was more concerned with transmitting that truth than he was transmitting a perfect book. Okay? Ask yourself, do you believe that or not? That God really wasn't interested in transmitting to the, all the 40 men that wrote the scriptures that God really, really didn't care if after Moses wrote his book of the law and put it inside the, the Ark of the Covenant that later scribes may have copied a word wrong and God looks at that and says, that's okay. It doesn't affect any of the laws that I gave him and it doesn't affect any of the doctrine I gave them. Does that sound like something you can believe? Not a chance. Not a chance. Exactly. Uh, this, this scholar, you guys sitting in these pews tonight have more knowledge and understanding of the Bible than that guy does. And he's got a doctorate and he is a, uh, a tenured professor and he teaches, he goes all around the world giving lectures and conferences and this and that and the other and he is probably paid well for this. But the bottom line is he's dead wrong. If God did not transmit truth to us and then supernaturally preserve that truth in every single word then we got a problem we have a big problem okay uh, something's not right okay what if your bank sent you a, a bank statement Melissa what if your bank sent you a bank statement and they shorted you about 1200 bucks out of your account. Does it matter? Sure it does. But what if the bank sent you a statement and shorted you a dollar and 12 cents? Huh? You're calling the bank, aren't you? Excuse me. You guys shorted me a dollar twelve cents. Now I know that sounds petty and it doesn't. Uh, it sounds like it's not a big deal, but we got to decide whose dollar and twelve cents this is going to belong to. That's right. I earned the money. I put it in your bank. If you're going to jip me a dollar and twelve cents every month, what's that going to turn into in about twenty years? A lot. So it does matter, doesn't it? It matters. Every word matters. So when it comes to this story especially, the resurrection of Christ, is it important that we believe that? One of the scholars that they told us about, it may have been Karl Barth, I don't remember, but he was one of these German theologians, and he said this, it's not, it's not all important 
that Jesus actually existed. What's important is that we believe that Jesus existed. Who accepts that? Not me. You're asking me to believe in uh, jolly old Saint Nick then. Because it's not important whether he existed or not. It's important whether we believe he existed. Which is basically the theme of every Santa Claus movie that's ever made. If you think about it. Miracle on 34th Street or the Santa Claus or whatever. You got to believe. You got to believe. You got to believe. But he doesn't exist. But you got to believe anyway. He doesn't believe because you, he doesn't exist because you don't believe. Anyway, that's the story. Now we get, so we get to Thomas. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, open our eyes to your word. We thank you, Lord, for it. Bless uh, your word tonight. Open our eyes and our hearts, Lord, uh, to the, the rightness of your word. And God, not one word is wrong. There's not one mistake. There's not a, 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 a fault in how the the copies were transmitted. There's not an error in an earlier transmission. There, this Bible is right. And you promised that it would be. And God, you don't break promises. So open up our eyes and unite our hearts together in the belief that we all together tonight make it our statement of faith that we believe every word of God is pure. Bless this book tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Now, in verse uh, 24, chapter 20, uh, John 20 is, it starts out the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene came and she uh, was looking for the Lord. He wasn't there in the tomb. She was wondering where they had put him and so on. And... Um, Finally, she ends up talking to him. And finally, Jesus said, it is I, uh, Mary, be not afraid. And uh, so anyway, in verse 24 now, uh, Jesus appears to, his, to the disciples. And, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus. If you ever look that word up, it means Didymus and Thomas, I, if I remember right, both of them mean twins. Twins. I think Thomas was a twin brother, is what I think. Uh, somebody, it's been a long time since I looked that word up, so maybe you can check it out for me at Blue Letter Bible and find out if that's true or not. But that's, that's what I... Uh, I looked it up a long time ago and that's kind of what I remember was that Thomas, uh, his name Thomas and Didymus, the word Didymus has the word die in it. Die usually means two. Uh, it means twin. Whew. All right, I was right. But anyway, uh, Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Poor Thomas. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, I'll just throw this out to you just to muddy up the waters a little bit in your own mind. There's two schools of thought on this. On where they drove the spikes. The traditional idea is that they drove it right through here in between. Let's see, what are these? The, uh, the tarsals are the feet, right? And the I don't remember. But anyway, right between these bones here so that not a bone of him would be broken. Okay? That's one theory. 
The other theory is that it went through here, still not breaking any bones because you got two bones here, the radius and the ulna, and it goes through here because that would hold him to the cross, driving the nails in here, and then him putting all of his weight on this my, probably would have ripped clean off, okay? Um, unless, of course, they tied him first to hold him, and then they drove the nails in his hand. It doesn't matter. God didn't draw us a, a, a chart and put it in the Bible for us. It just says hands, and so there it is. Okay? But that's what Thomas is looking for. I, I want to see a hole. Somewhere in here, I want to see a hole. Because I know they drove the nails in here. And that's what I want to see. And, if, and except I see that, I'm not going to believe it. I will not believe. Thomas, of course, has been called Doubting Thomas. We use that phrase now. You're a Doubting Thomas, and it's all in reference to Thomas. Poor Thomas. That for the last 2,000 years, the only thing that is really known of him is that he refuses to believe until he sees. Now, we have a doctrine that tells us, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Okay? But, is Jesus, when he finally shows up, is Jesus going to say, Sorry, Thomas. You had your chance to believe, and you didn't do it, so I'm kicking you out. Did Jesus do that? No, he's all, he had grace on him. He had mercy on him, all right? So anyway, Thomas is, is firm in his mind. He says, I will not believe. And... All of this now, I put up here a supernatural event because I like it when stuff like this happens. Okay? Hollywood, in its best, cannot match the special effects that Jesus performed while he was here on this earth. Amen? And I'm saying that because uh, since Sunday I bought the Ten Commandments. And I'm watching special effects from the 1950s. And, and uh, it was pretty cool how they did. They explained how they did some of the things that they did. And if you ever watch the Ten Commandments, and if you look closely, when God is writing uh, the Ten Commandments there, and, you know, the, the, it's a cartoon part here of fire, and the cartoon uh, fire goes, and when it touches the plate, all of a sudden, this fire starts coming out of this rock and it's drawing these Hebrew letters. If you look real closely in a, in a couple of those scenes, you can actually see the Hebrew letters already there because what they did was they made up some kind of paste or something like that made of gunpowder and they, and they put, it over, put it in where the letters, they had already carved out the letters and they put in uh, uh, this gunpowder formula in there and there's a guy standing behind uh, all of that and on cue he hits a button and it ignites the gunpowder in it and it, it, it looks cool doesn't it okay that was back before CGI amen so they had to figure out how to do this and they did a pretty good job the, the water turning to blood uh, there was literally a guy uh, behind that pool of water that basically opened a valve and all this blood started coming out. Uh, the picture that Pharaoh has, he's blessing the water. He's giving the water of the gods and blessing the water. Well, he's got a two-chamber pot. And the first chamber is water and he's dumping it out. And then when, it's, when water comes out, then all of a sudden the second chamber opens up and it starts pouring out blood. And then he drops it in someone. I, I just like stuff like that. But anyway, these were real effects. 
Jesus, boom, showed up. He appeared. He disappeared. You remember later on, he has a meal with the two guys that he's walking down the road with. And they're talking about, oh man, it's a terrible day. You should, should have been in Jerusalem. Man, they killed Jesus and it's terrible. I don't know what we're going to do. And, and then all of a sudden, Jesus began to talk to him and, and show them out of the law how Christ would be the Messiah. And he's eating with them. And then all of a sudden, he disappears. And the men immediately go, oh, that was Jesus. And all the time they didn't know it because Jesus had kind of blinded their eyes a little bit. But as soon as he left, instantly, oh, that was Jesus. Oh, we saw Jesus. He ate this bread. I'm going to save this bread forever. Okay. John chapter 20, verse 26. And after eight days again. And I, and I, want, you to, I want you to think of something. Jesus is making appearances. And he's going to do this now for a pretty good while. Josh McDowell, who um, back in the 70s, wrote a uh, book on apologetics. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, no, he wrote a book on apologetics uh, and called it... Um, uh, what did he call it? Who remembers that? The case, I don't know. The case for God or something like that. Huh? No, not the case for Christ. Huh? Look up Josh McDowell. Find out what book he wrote. And it sold millions of copies. Millions of copies. It was like a New York Times bestseller. Because at the time he wrote it, Time Magazine had already come out with an article saying, Is God dead? Yes. Evidence that demands a verdict. And then he wrote a book that I read and did a report on in college called The Resurrection Factor. Okay, uh, But anyway, evidence that demands a verdict. And basically, uh, Josh McDowell put it down and he said, if this, if this issue of Christ appearing after his death were to go in front of a judge and a jury in this country, the verdict absolutely would come back. Yes, he's alive. No doubt whatsoever. If you bring in... All those witnesses, witness after witness after witness, who are testifying and saying, look, I saw him die. I was there at the cross. I helped pull him down off of the cross. I checked his pulse. The man was dead. He was obviously dead. He had already turned cold and so on. And I helped bury him. I put him in the tomb. The tomb was sealed so that nobody could mess with it. There were Roman guards there who knew that if they, uh, if they allowed anybody anywhere near that tomb, those guys would have faced uh, the death penalty as soldiers for being derelict in their duty. And uh, he, you know, he said they would testify to the fact that Jesus was in the tomb one minute and then the next minute the tomb is open and now he's gone. And then you have all these people, starting with Mary Magdalene, who saw him alive. And you have, uh, the Bible says, upwards of 500 people saw him alive after his resurrection. So that part of it was in a book called The Resurrection Factor. And uh, that's basically what Josh McDowell was doing. And he said, if we were to apply the rules of evidence that exist in our country right now, and apply all the laws and all the rules and guidelines where we have a trial to prove or disprove something, there is absolutely no doubt 100% the judgment, the ruling would come back, yes, he was alive, there is no mistaking it. Jesus died and he came back to life and all of these people saw him alive and that's our verdict. And that's what people have to deal with. They don't like it, 
but it's true. Amen? Because if Jesus died and he comes back to life, automatically now the Christian religion is far superior to any other religion ever. Amen? Because out of all of the religions, Muhammad's dead. He didn't come back to life. Buddha's dead. He didn't come back to life. Uh, Joseph Smith's dead. He didn't come back to life. When, when, oh my goodness. Um, and you just name the religion. None of them have a savior coming back to life again, living and breathing and solid. And so that's what he's doing here. In verse uh, 26 of chapter 20, after eight days again, his disciples were within, Thomas with them, finally. Then came Jesus. The door is being shut. So how did Jesus get there? How did he get there? He's Jesus. He's God. Amen. He can show up, boom, anywhere he wants. Walls can't keep him in. And by the way, that idea of walls not being able to keep him in or out, that also applies to whatever apostle may be locked in prison later. Because they're going to get out too. Prison doors just all swinging open all at once and the prison guards are going, oh no, i got to kill myself. Cause, oh my goodness. Okay. So anyway, the door is being shut. And he stood in the midst. I mean, this is a supernatural event. And this is, this, this, I don't, I don't look for things like this to uh, bolster my faith. But it doesn't hurt. I like things like this. Because it just furthers my belief that Jesus is God. So the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger. And behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand. Thrust it into my side. Be not faithless. But believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him. My Lord. And my God. Now. Underline that verse. And the next time. A Jehovah's Witness. Freak. Comes to your house. Or a Mormon. And you underline that and you say, excuse me, but it's testified of Thomas that Jesus is both Lord and God. And the Bible doesn't lie. And I don't know how the New World Translation does away with I've got a copy of it. Somebody sent it to me. I don't know how they do away with it. Uh, I remember years ago, I I every time I'd come up with what I thought was a good verse to where I could prove to Brady Crumb when he was Jehovah's Witness that Jesus was God. Every time I could think of another one, I'd call him. Hey, Brady, how you doing? Well, I'm fine. Hey, listen, I got a verse I want to run by you. And I would give him the verse... And ev I mean, every time he'd open up his New World Translation and they had twisted and moved that verse around and turned it in such a way is that it took away from testifying of the deity of Christ. Yes. Exactly. My Lord and my God. Okay. 
Well, I think, if, if I remember right, I think Brady said one time that at that point he's not talking to Jesus, he's talking to God in heaven. Okay? Well, that's a cheap way to get by that. My Lord and my God, Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me and thou hast believed. Believed what? That he's Lord and God. But watch this now. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You see, I'm not like Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts said that God, God, the God, number one, big cheese, head honcho God, showed up to uh, uh, Oral Roberts and told him, Oral, where's the money? No, I just... Uh, Oral, I want you to build a hospital. And God showed Oral an image of a 300 foot tall pair of folded hands. And he said, I want you to build that, put it into the hospital. Now, when Oral told everybody that, basically it was a, it was a, it was a money raising scam, is what it was. Because he went to the city of Tulsa, the, the city people who run and govern the city, the mayor and all the councilmen or whatever, and told them that he wanted permission to build a hospital. And they said, in that area, we don't need a hospital. We got hospitals all over the place. Don't please don't build a hospital there because it, we, we don't need it. Nope, God told me to build a hospital, so I'm going to build a hospital. So I don't know how he got it done. But he got it done and he built this humongous hospital with a pair of praying hands in the front of it still there it's not a hospital anymore um, I think the last I heard I'm and this has been a long time ago but they um, they basically turned it into I think they turned it into an office building and then, I may be wrong on this, but I think they turned it into an apartment building. Okay? And um, when they built the bronze, and these hands are huge. I mean, we're talking, I don't know, 150 feet, something like that. That they couldn't get them to, to go together. They wouldn't go together. There was an error in how they modeled the brass and uh, so they brought in engineers and all the guys that was architects and everything like that trying to figure out how to get that hand to close and one of the guys that had worked on it said I, I know how to do this and they said how and he said get me a bucket lift and I'll show you and he got in that bucket lift and he said now raise me up to the top of those hands and he reached in his pocket and took out a $20 bill and dropped it and it went Worked. I made that up. I've had that joke for 35 years, I think. I learned it at Bible college. No, listen to this, people. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. That's us. You know, I, we, we crave sometimes to see the Red Sea parted. Oh, how I'd like to see the burning bush. Oh, how I'd like to see those chariots surrounding. I'd like to watch Elijah going up into heaven by that, by that chariot and that horse of fire and that chariot of fire and that whirlwind. And Oh, I would like to see those miracles. I'd like to see Jesus feed 5,000 people. 
uh, from uh, a loaf of bread and two fishes. I would like to see those miracles that Jesus did. I'd like to see Jesus alive after he's been declared dead. I would love to see all of those miracles. But the truth of it is, there is a greater blessing on us who have not seen those things, and yet we still believe them. Uh, turn to, and this is what, this is what Peter was, was getting at when in, um, oh, let's see, what is it? First Peter, second Peter, chapter one. Second Peter chapter one. Yeah. Verse 17. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. They heard the voice of God. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. I didn't hear that voice. But I've got that sure word of prophecy. I have not seen the miracles that Jesus did. I've not seen the Red Sea part. I've not seen manna fall down from heaven. And I will tell you that there is always people Always, you're going to see them on Facebook, you're going to see them in, on, on YouTube, you're going to see them all over social media. They're all the time bragging and boasting about all the, the miracles that they have seen God do and how, how they prophesied God was going to do this and lo and behold, He did that. I remember I did a Prophecy Club meeting back uh, years and years and years ago and it was down in... Um, down in um, Mississippi, I believe. And um, I got there and was just kind of, I, I came into the room, got set up, and was listening to just people talk. And there was one guy in this, in this room. And it's like the Holy Ghost said, Mike, watch this guy. So I did. I just kind of paid attention to him as he went from group to group in this room. And he said the same thing in every group that he got into. He would get into them, he'd get with them and kind of get involved in the conversation and then kind of direct the conversation toward uh, what he wanted them to do. And then he came out with it and said, God showed me 9-11 weeks before it ever happened. And he would tell a little bit about that and then once, once he made his mark on that group, he would go to another group and he would do the same thing. And I'm watching this guy. And God said, Mike, that guy's lying through his teeth. Because, and what I wanted to ask him was, if you really knew that 9-11 was going to happen before it happened for the sake and the love of God why were you not there on September 11th begging those people not to go in that building that was the one thing that I thought I'd like to ask him that you know what he was doing he was going around puffing himself up with various groups in there that he was some big spiritual thing that, and I, he probably had a church somewhere and he was there bloated and puffed up with this story that God showed him a vision of 9-11 before it ever happened and that he, he saw it and he and, you know, he's a prophet now. He's a prophet of God and God shows him things. You know, all he's trying to do is talk people into believing that he is some man that's real close to God and you should come to his church. And people like that, I got no use for. I absolutely got no use for whatsoever. Because number one, I know they're lying through their teeth. 
And uh, number two, I know why they're doing it. They're trying to draw to them. They're trying to make disciples. Just like, uh, just like Peter said. They're trying to draw men to them to make disciples of them out of those people. So that they will give him uh, their, their money. They will start following him. They will start going to his church. So on and so on and so on. And fault, there's false teachers like that everywhere. There's false prophets like that everywhere. And isn't that something that you can go around telling people, I saw that happen in a dream before that ever happened. You have no idea if I did or not, right? You have no idea what I've seen. I, or I could say, hey, I saw, I saw Hamas attacking Israel I, God showed it to me a month before it ever happened. And you know what? Some people will follow that kind of stuff. Because they're looking, they look at the Bible and they say, well, yeah, I love the Bible. But down deep inside, to them, it's not enough. The Bible's not enough for them. It doesn't have... The really good stuff, like like this guy's got this guy's got really good stuff because he he can see, God shows him the future, and they'll fall for that stuff, and it's their own fault for doing it. It's their own fault. Now I like the fact that the Bible is full of supernatural events. I believe everything that I'm reading here. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. I believe that Thomas saw the holes in Jesus' hand. I believe he saw the wound in Jesus' side. I believe Thomas at that point said, Oh, my Lord and my God. But I believe the Bible besides that. And what is it? A, uh, what kind of generation seeketh after a sign? A wicked and adulterous generation always seeking after a sign. They want some miracle to prove that you're of God. You give them the word of God and tell them the word of God, they may or may not believe it. You show them a miracle. You show them a trick. They'll fall for it every time. They will fall for it every time.